for joining us this afternoon for our MDA Engage community webinar on updates in research and treatments in myotonic dystrophy. My name is Marissa Lozano. I'm the Director of Community Education at MDA, and we are very excited to have you join us today for this important and educational webinar. This webinar is part of our larger MDA Engage community programs, which focus on bringing the neuromuscular disease community together around education and resources. Be sure to visit MDA Engage section on our website for updates on upcoming virtual education events. We are recording today's event and we'll be posting it to our website for on-demand viewing. Uh, please know that all phone lines have been muted. We will have a question and answer session at the end of the webinar. So please be sure to utilize the Q&A window or the chat to type in your questions. Um, you can type your questions in as we go. You don't need to wait until the end. Um, and then when the presentation's over, we will address as many questions as we can. Um, before we begin, I'd like to say a big thank you to our speaker today, Dr. Lauren Elman, who you will meet shortly. I'd also like to thank our event supporter, Avidity Biosciences. We would not be able to provide community education webinars like this if not for their support. So thank you very much. And MDA has led the way in accelerating research, advancing care, and advocating for the support of our families. Our mission is to empower people living with muscular dystrophy, ALS, and related neuromuscular diseases to live longer, more independent lives. Now I'd like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Lauren Elman. She's the MDA Care Center Director at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Elman graduated with a degree in psychology from Cornell University and received her MD from Cornell University Medical College. She completed medical internship, neurology residency, and neuromuscular fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Elman is now a member of the faculty at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School. Her specialty is neuromuscular diseases, and she has a particular interest in treating adults with acquired and inherited disorders of muscle, as well as ALS. She sees patients both at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania and at Pennsylvania Hospital. So, Dr. Elman, thank you for sharing your time and expertise with us today. I will now just turn the time over to you. Thank you very much, Marissa, and thank you to the MDA for inviting me to speak today on myotonic dystrophy, which is a disorder that's very close to my heart. Um, I've been treating folks with myotonic dystrophy for 20 years, and um, I'm super excited to see the advancements that are being made. So today I'm gonna take you through a pretty quick tour of the things that we need to be aware of clinically in myotonic dystrophy, the sum of the science behind myotonic dystrophy and how that is leading us to advancements in treatment and hopefully a meaningful treatment for the underlying disease within the next few years. These are my disclosures. Um, every good um, science talk starts with a slide on epidemiology, so here is ours. But particularly of note, myotonic dystrophy is actually a very common disorder. One of the reasons that it is a common disorder is that the incidence, meaning how many people are born with the disorder, is fairly high at one in three to 8,000 worldwide. And the prevalence is also fairly high because most people with myotonic dystrophy live a normal lifespan. So once born with myotonic dystrophy, since people live a normal lifespan, the population is at a very high number. Myotonic dystrophy type two is a much rarer disorder and accounts for only about 2% of myotonic dystrophy. And it's much more common in Eastern European kindreds. In the old days, uh, I should also say that every good neuromuscular talk has to include a slide of a muscle biopsy. So since I am a little bit old school, I have included one here. Um, in the old days, we used to help make the diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy with a muscle biopsy. I strongly doubt that anyone listening to this talk even had a muscle biopsy, um, but maybe a few of you did. And if you did, um, this is probably what it looked like. Um, a normal muscle biopsy, would not have, and those little purple dots are nuclei. Um, the um, pink pieces are muscle cells and each muscle cell has multiple nuclei. And hopefully you can see my pointer here, but under normal circumstances, the nuclei should be arranged on the outside of the muscle 
And when things are not quite normal, sometimes the nuclei are um, displaced into the middle of the cell, and that's what you see here. In addition, um, under normal circumstances, the, the size and shape of the fibers is quite uniform. They would all look quite the same and very, um, very um, boring. But in this um, slide, you can see that we have some smaller cells and some larger cells, so it looks a bit disorganized. Um, one of the one of the ways I see myself as a clinician who takes care of people with myotonic dystrophy, if this resonates with any of you out there who remember Love Boat from the 1970s, uh, this is Julie McCoy. She's our cruise director. And I often think of myself that way in the way I care for my patients because myotonic dystrophy is really a multi-system disorder. And even though a lot of patients present to the neurologist with this disorder, there are a lot of things that we need to think about when we take care of people with myotonic dystrophy, a lot of different systems that can become involved. So I like to think of myself as the cruise director and make sure that all of the people that I take care of get to all of the doctors that they need to see. So just to drive that point home, in this slide, you can see that there are uh, pictures of all of the different organ systems that can be affected in myotonic dystrophy. And we'll go through each of these one by one. But of course, we have muscle, we have cardiac, we have eye, we have risks for cancer, we have the lungs here, um, the digestive system here, this is the endocrine system here, and this, of course, is the brain. So we'll go through um, each of these to just discuss how myotonic dystrophy can affect them. So um, for starters, myotonic dystrophy um, can affect a little bit the way people look. So there's a certain phenotype, which is the way a person looks, that may suggest that a person has myotonic dystrophy. And this is a very old sort of classic picture of someone with myotonic dystrophy that um, shows some wasting of the temporalis muscle here. Um, a sort of a long, thin face that doesn't have a lot of musculature because of this muscle wasting here and wasting of a muscle called the masseter, which is a muscle that we use for chewing. There's also ptosis, which is drooping of the eyelids, balding that is very specific of the frontal area, which, by the way, has never been explained, and a pattern of weakness in myotonic dystrophy type 1 that early on is very distal. So you tend to see these very tapered limbs. So um, thinning of the arms below the elbows and the legs below the knees. As I mentioned, the early weakness in myotonic dystrophy tends to be distal, so far away from the core of the body. Um, in the hands and in about the ankles. And oftentimes, the first weakness that a person will notice outside of the hands is with what is known as a foot drop. And this is weakness of the muscles that hold the foot up, so the muscles that we use to bend our toes up towards our nose. And that is called the action of dorsiflexion, which brings your foot up. And that can result in what's called a foot drop, which can lead to difficulty with walking and um, a tendency towards tripping and can be ameliorated with bracing um, and supportive shoes. What is myotonia? Um, myotonia is actually failure of muscle relaxation. It can be experienced as muscle stiffness or difficulty um, releasing of the grip. It can also be experienced as sort of a stickiness when you close your eyes and difficulty sort of opening them up. We can elicit it on examination by tapping certain muscles and noting how they release rather slowly. There are medications available to treat myotonia and we know how to treat it because we actually do know what causes it. And this is gonna be sort of a repeating theme in this, in this talk, so I'm gonna explain it a little bit to you. So again, myotonia is failure of muscle relaxation. Um, if any of you ever had an electrical test called an EMG, we can see myotonia on the EMG electrically, and that is illustrated for you here. Um, and it sounds, it has a very classic sound that is often described as a dive bomber. Um, which hopefully none of us have ever heard in real life and never will. Um, but we know what causes myotonia. And what causes myotonia, it's an electrical phenomenon. 
and our muscles actually work on electricity. There's a muscle membrane, which is on the outside of the muscle here, and there's an electrical charge that is normal to develop across the muscle membrane. And there are little channels or openings in that muscle membrane and charged particles or ions travel across that muscle membrane. By the way, sarcolemma is the science word for muscle membrane. So under normal circumstances, there are channels that allow charged particles or ions, one of which is chloride, to travel through that membrane and maintain a normal electrical charge across the membrane. When that charge is not maintained at its normal polarity, then things are, are fouled up, if you will, and there can be failure of proper muscle relaxation. And in myotonic dystrophy, there's a problem with one of the chloride channels that causes this charge to get messed up. And the reason there's a problem with one of these chloride channels is that the protein, the chloride channel is made up of protein, and the protein that makes the chloride channel is not properly made. And I'm gonna come back to this later, a couple times actually, and explain how this has led partly to our understanding of this disease. But that, so that's some of the science behind why people with myotonic dystrophy develop myotonia. But it also happens to be a treatable symptom, and there are a variety of different medications that can be used to treat myotonia. And the choice of, of drug actually dip, that your physician may choose depends to some extent on what other underlying medical issues you have, some related to myotonic dystrophy and some potentially not related to myotonic dystrophy. One very important thing to know about in myotonic dystrophy is of course that the heart can be involved. And this is something that we always need to pay very, very close attention to. And the reason that we need to pay, pay close attention to this is because this is an issue that if we do pay close attention, we can intervene and prevent um, trouble. Um, so the reason that there can be cardiac issues is not actually related to the cardiac muscle itself. It's related to the conduction system or the conduction of electricity through the heart. So the heart works by conducting electricity. There's a, there's a common theme here. Um, but when the conduction system gets interfered with, bad things can happen. And it turns out that in myotonic dystrophy, there can be fibrotic tissue, so connective tissue and things that don't belong that interfere with the conduction system. And that can lead to changes in the EKG. So these, these different um, features of the rhythm strip here, this is a regular rhythm strip of the EKG. All of these different intervals have names, like this one is called the PR interval, and this is the QRS duration. And when any of these become outside of their normal values, then that can trigger a, a major issue with the heart. Some of these things can be controlled with medication, and some may require implantation of a device. So um, an implantable defibrillator or a pacemaker. These days, most of the time, if you have a device implanted, it will be a multifunctioning device. So a device that can help with a heart rate that is too slow. And that type of a device is a pacemaker, which will trigger your heart to beat if it's beating too slowly. Or a defibrillator, which will stop your heart from beating if it's beating too quickly. Because unfortunately, people with myotonic dystrophy can be at risk for both of those issues. But of course, the good news is, is that if you are at risk for that, based on some of your um, cardiac monitoring tests, you can have one of these devices implanted and that can be a huge protection against anything bad happening to you. So at our institution, we have a couple of cardiologists who are particular specialists in myotonic dystrophy and who keep very close eye on our population, um, including some implantable monitors that um, get very large samples of their cardiac data to decide when and if an intervention needs to be taken. So another thing that we know about people with myotonic dystrophy is that certain anesthetics that are used in surgery or in um, procedures do not agree with people with myotonic dystrophy. Exactly why this is, 
is a little bit mysterious, but the point is that we know about it. And so we just simply don't use these drugs in people with myotonic dystrophy. Um, there's a common misconception that these drugs cause a condition called malignant hyperthermia in people with myotonic dystrophy. That is not accurate. That is a condition that is caused in other muscle disorders, but not myotonic dystrophy. Um, there are good ideas about how to be aware of this. Um, you can wear a medic alert bracelet. Um, that I realize that doesn't appeal to a lot of people. In my clinic, we give out laminated cards that we advise people to carry in their wallets in case they're ever in a situation where they can't speak for themselves. And first responders are instructed to look through wallets for things like this. Um, these can also be convenient to hand to physicians if a surgery is scheduled. And of course, we're always happy to talk to other uh, physicians about this, but it's very important for you to tell another physician that you have myotonic dystrophy so that they can take the appropriate um, considerations um, for scheduling surgery that may include anesthesia. Doesn't mean, by the way, that you can't have surgery. There are plenty of options. It just means that certain medications need to be avoided. There can be pulmonary manifestations in myotonic dystrophy. It's not terribly common, to be honest, but um, we do screen for it because it can occur. And when it does, again, this is a treatable disorder. Um, basically, the way we screen for it is just by asking people about symptoms they might be having um, related to trouble sleeping or snoring or feeling unrefreshed after a night's sleep. And then if there are any if there's any suggestion that there's a pulmonary problem, we get tend to get pulmonary function tests. But the important thing to do is to have those pulmonary function tests in an upright position and a lying flat on your back position to determine if there's a change in the results in those two positions. If there is a change in the results, then that indicates the potential of neuromuscular respiratory insufficiency. And if that's present, then we refer to a pulmonologist who's skilled in this type of management. And generally speaking, the management is with non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, which is often used at night. The device that you see down in the corner there is an example. Um, it's very much like a CPAP machine, which if you know anybody who has sleep apnea, they may use. Uh, but generally speaking, we we tend to prefer BiPAP, which stands for bi-level positive airway pressure, because that helps with both inhalation pressure as well as exhalation pressure. And this can, can really be extraordinarily helpful under uh, circumstances of neuromuscular respiratory impairment. As many of you probably know, people with myotonic dystrophy are prone to cataracts. It happens under the microscope, it happens to look not like the usual senile cataracts. It's actually a much prettier um, thing to look at. Um, not pretty at all in what it does, though, because it does impair vision. The good news is that um, if these cataracts do occur, they can be removed in the same way that usual and customary cataracts are removed, and then vision is restored. In my practice, I don't really insist that um, people go see an ophthalmologist regularly. I just ask about um, symptoms, and when symptoms occur, then it's time to see an ophthalmologist. And just so you know, the early symptoms of, of cataracts would be difficulty with night vision and any color desaturation, meaning that colors look less vibrant or brilliant than they had before. And the reason that I don't insist early on in ophthalmologic examination is because there are a lot of physicians that I do sort of force <laughs> or strongly suggest that my patients see. So if I can eliminate one, then so be it. And they go see the ophthalmologist at which time it's necessary. And the reason for that is that taking the cataracts out early doesn't improve clinical outcome. Unfortunately, GI manifestations can be a huge quality of life issue for people with myotonic dystrophy and they really do need to be managed fairly aggressively. Um, the main issue is really GI dysmotility. So there's a lot of problems with moving things through the gut. And this isn't actually due to muscular weakness. It's a different type of issue. So it's not the same reason that you would have foot drop, um, but nonetheless, it's extremely problematic. Um, it needs to be managed um, and we need to make sure that people are moving their bowels on a regular basis and if not, that needs to be addressed pharmacologically. And um, there are a lot of medications 
on the market that are FDA approved for um, irritable bowel syndrome, which actually can be somewhat helpful in this setting um, and, and, you know, under proper guidance can be quite useful. There are um, quite a few important neuropsychiatric issues related to myotonic dystrophy. There is the so-called myotonic personality, which is not talked about much anymore, but in the old textbooks, it's talked about quite a bit. In fact, we don't really have textbooks anymore because we everything's online and so, but in the old days we had textbooks and there would be a chapter on myotonic dystrophy and there would be a section in it on the myotonic personality. They did this because they didn't have much else to talk about. They didn't have genetics to talk about and all that other interesting stuff. So they would describe the so-called myotonic personality about apathy and, you know, sort of, um, not everybody, of course, but there was a select group of people who tended not to care about their own health care or sort of take care of themselves very well. And there's this very famous description of a myotonic that you could you could spot the home of a myotonic person because their garden was unkept. Um, that was written by a very famous neurologist. So I don't necessarily know that that always holds true. <laughs> Certainly not. But um, there is a concern that some people with myotonic dystrophy are not as invested in their own health care and need a little extra push sometimes. Um, certainly, we see a lot of central hypersomnolence, which just means that people with myotonic dystrophy are very sleepy, and then that, that, that sleepiness actually comes directly from the brain, from the wakefulness centers. There is available pharmacologic management that does seem to work, but there are no drugs that have an indication for myotonic dystrophy, meaning that there are no drugs that are FDA approved for the treatment of myotonic dystrophy which makes getting them paid for by insurance very difficult. So now there is one drug that is currently in a phase two trial to in, in myotonic dystrophy type one for central hypersomnolence. And if it succeeds, hopefully it will get an FDA indication for myotonic dystrophy, which would be quite helpful, I believe. Um, another major issue that is becoming increasingly recognized is the cognitive decline that we see in people with myotonic dystrophy. There is currently not as much research as there should be on this, um, not even a lot of very good descriptions out there. And there is, you know, currently, again, no treatment available, and it's just really supportive care. There are myriad endocrine issues that we need to monitor for in people with myotonic dystrophy. Um, diabetes, thyroid dysfunction, and hyperlipidemia can be monitored for with blood tests. And um, if and when they occur, they are treated in the same way that they would be treated in someone who didn't have myotonic dystrophy. The interesting thing to watch out for very specifically is that a very thin person with myotonic dystrophy who doesn't look at all like they might have diabetes might very well have diabetes. So um, that's something to be uh, aware of and um, certainly should be um, screened for. Unfortunately, erectile dysfunction is a major problem in people with myotonic dystrophy. It can be treated again the same way it's treated in, in others. Um, infertility is an issue in both men and women. Um, and often, um, if, if the diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy is made in adulthood, a history of infertility will be, will be present and the reasons that nobody knew why they had infertility and this will be um, the answer in retrospect. We are on alert for some skin tumors. One of them, most notably, is something called pilomatricoma, which often occurs on the head and neck. Um, it is usually benign, but rarely can, um, can become malignant. So when they get large, they should be removed. Um, this is why oftentimes you'll find your neurologist giving you a little head massage when you come in for a visit asking you if, that, if you have any lumps or bumps on your head that you know about. Um, don't be alarmed if they ask you. Um, and these are easily taken care of um, when they're identified. Um, but for some reason, they're often multiple in people with myotonic dystrophy. There is unfortunately an increased risk of cancer in people with myotonic dystrophy. The most common is skin cancer. Um, and this would be the reason that you're your neurologist would tell you to, or ask you if you've seen um, 
uh, a dermatologist. It's usually not the skin cancer that is the most fearsome, which is melanoma. Most commonly, it's basal cell carcinoma, and these are just the cancers that need to be sliced off before they turn into any trouble. But still, you should be monitored for them. Um, in addition, there are some other organs that can be prone to cancer a little bit more frequently in people with myotonic dystrophy, but this can be found with usual and customary um, age-appropriate cancer screening. But you, you are just because you have myotonic dystrophy doesn't mean that you are, um, you know, you are exempt from your usual um, age-related cancer screening. So. Um, Another part of education for patients um, or families who have myotonic dystrophy in them is pregestational diagnosis. So because we know the gene that causes myotonic dystrophy, we can offer uh, pregestational diagnosis to uh, patients and families who have myotonic dystrophy in them. So it's important to ask at, at visits about family planning. Family planning, of course, is a euphemism for are you pregnant or becoming or planning to become pregnant or are you planning to um, get someone pregnant or this kind of a thing. And it's important that people are educated about what options are available, hopefully before they come, become pregnant. But I have gotten the oops phone call and people want to know, you know, what can I do now? Um, there are a couple of different options depending on if someone is having a planned pregnancy or if they have already become pregnant about determining um, if the fetus is affected or having um, in vitro fertilization to guarantee an unaffected child. So um, this is something to know about. It's also something that I discuss with older family members so that they make sure to inform younger family members about the potential for genetic testing so they can um, appropriately plan out their families. So um, let's talk about some clinical differences between type 1 and type 2 myotonic dystrophy. Uh, for one thing, um, type 2 tends to be a bit milder. It tends to have later onset in terms of clinical manifestations. Importantly, the pattern of weakness is very different between type 1 and type 2. I mentioned that in type 1, the early weakness tends to be distal, sort of far away from the core of the body, whereas in type 1, it's actually proximal. So it tends to, weakness tends to affect the, affect the hip flexors, making it difficult to rise from a chair, and the neck flexors, um, making it difficult to sort of hold your head up, um, but the face is usually spared. In myotonic dystrophy um, type um, 2, we have not identified a congenital form, which is a severe form present at birth. And also of no clinical myotonia is often absent. That being said, if an EMG is done, that electrical test that I mentioned earlier, we can usually find electrical evidence of myotonia. What are the similarities between DM1 and DM2? So the similarities are that they both have the same systemic manifestations, including all of the issues that I just um, went over. So people with DM2, even though they may have mild weakness, they are still prone to all of the same um, things that we just discussed. So um, let's talk about some science. So myotonic dystrophy type 1 is a trinucleotide repeat disorder. And what does that mean? Well, the repeat disorders are a family of neurologic diseases. Um, there are different inheritance patterns, but of course, myotonic dystrophy is autosomal dominant, which means that it passes from one generation to another um, with the inheritance of one um, abnormal gene. And the trinucleotide disorders are caused by abnormal expansions of areas of the DNA that are characterized by repetitive sequences of DNA. And we're going to go over this. When the repeat length exceeds the stable threshold, the repeat then becomes unstable and may undergo intergenerational expansion. And again, we're going to go over that again. So there's a stable repeat length and there's an unstable repeat length. And if you have an unstable repeat length, that repeat length can get even bigger and bigger and bigger as the generations go forward. So the, um, the repeat in myotonic dystrophy type 1 is a CTG repeat. That doesn't matter. That's just the names of the nucleotides. 
and it happens to be located in an untranslated region of a gene on chromosome 19. So what does that mean? What does untranslated region mean? What that means is that this part of the gene actually does not encode a protein, which is really quite mysterious because how could a, an area of the gene that doesn't even encode a protein cause so much havoc? And we're gonna come back to that. So um, what does anticipation in myotonic dystrophy mean? So this is a term that you've probably heard of or an idea that you're probably familiar with, which is that longer repeats, and some of you may know how many repeats you have, for example, can lead to earlier onset and more severe disease or phenotype, which means what the, the character of the disease is. So maybe to start sort of in the middle of this um, list here, Classic myotonic dystrophy occurs when you have between 100 and 1,000 repeats. If you have greater than 1,000 repeats, that would be considered quite severe disease and might even be associated with congenital myotonic dystrophy. The normal range of repeats is between 5 and 37. Then there are these intermediate ranges called the premutation range and the proto-mutation range. Generally speaking, in the proto-mutation range, people would not have symptoms of weakness and other things, but what they may have actually are cataracts and cardiac abnormalities. And I would also be very, very careful of anesthesia for people in this range. So these people, even though they don't have classic disease, are actually prone to some of the um, systemic manifestations that people with classic disease have. This is a classic picture from a very, very old textbook. Um, and what it illustrates is people in successive generations. So this younger uh, boy has obviously much more severe disease with weakness in his face and um, his neck. And then this is his mother who has some uh, weakness. She has some ptosis here with some lid drooping and a little bit of weakness in the face. And this is the grandmother um, who looks really, to be honest, quite normal. Um, but it is known that she was mildly symptomatic. And this is an example of how repeat length increases in successive generations, leading to younger age of onset and more severe phenotype. So how does that work, by the way? So this is an example of population genetics. So again, the repeats are called CTG repeats. And it turns out that five repeats is the most common um, the most common allele that we have. So everybody has two genes for this particular um, alleles are called genes. So everybody has two copies of this. So five is the most common number of repeats. Everybody has repeats. But the question really is, how does a disease that decreases reproductive fitness remain in the population at a steady rate? I already told you that um, infertility is an issue in people with myotonic dystrophy. So why doesn't this disease just sort of wipe itself out and cease to exist. And the reason for that is as follows. So it turns out that um, people who have um, a normal allele that has greater than 19 repeats are more likely to pass on their high number repeat allele than their low number repeat allele. So for a person who had two alleles, one with five repeats and one with 24 repeats, they would be more likely to pass on their 24 repeat allele than their five repeat allele. And thus their child would have a 24 repeat allele. And if that child had a 24 repeat allele and then a five repeat allele from their other parent, that child would pass on that 24 repeat allele and so on and so on and so on. And then it turns out that alleles that are greater than 19 repeats, even though these people have no evidence of disease, these tend to expand quite uh, quite a bit. So an allele that's only 19 repeats could expand and be as large as 75 repeats. And then in the following generation, that 75 repeat allele is very likely to be in the disease um, range. So over the course of just three generations, you could have completely normal um, repeat lengths turn into disease causing repeat lengths just by virtue of this odd um, 
feature of population genetics with these alleles. Now, why this evolved to be this way is absolutely unknown. There is no explanation for this. And you, ha you also have to be kind of careful when you ask about exp explanations in evolution. You can't always find one. Um, and this is one of the cases where that is definitely true. Another interesting thing about myotonic dystrophy is that there is something called parental bias in myotonic dystrophy, which is that um, there's a difference in how the, repeat the repeats are inherited maternally and paternally. So it turns out that in sperm, repeat lengths of 40 to 80 are likely to expand. So a change from the proto-mutation to classical DM is more often paternally inherited. But in eggs, only repeat lengths of greater than 100 are likely to expand. So in eggs, we tend to have very, very large repeat expansions. And that's why almost every reported case of congenital myotonic dystrophy is maternally inherited. So you're actually, if your father had myotonic dystrophy, you're actually more than 50% likely to inherit it from him. But if your mother had myotonic dystrophy, you're more likely to inherit a worse case, a more severe case. And that's called parental bias in myotonic dystrophy. Also, no scientific explanation has ever been suggested for this. So what is congenital myotonic dystrophy? Well, it turns out um, anytime you put the word congenital in front of anything, uh, it just means that it was evident in the delivery room. So the condition is, is severe enough that you can see it at birth. And it is characterized by, as we've already discussed, great, generally speaking, greater than a thousand repeats. Um, it's characterized by facial weakness that at birth can lead to breathing problems and feeding difficulties. Usually the, the, um, these both go, um, get better with age. Um, low tone in general, which also tends to get better with age. In the delivery room, you will not see the presence of clinical myotonia. Unfortunately, um, these children tend not to have completely normal intelligence. They will have developmental delay in what we call a chronic static encephalopathy, meaning learning differences and need for early intervention and those sorts of things. And as I've already mentioned, it's almost uniformly maternally inherited with very large repeat expansions. I take care of a number of women who were diagnosed with myotonic dystrophy after having a child with congenital myotonic dystrophy. So they, the mother never even knew that she was affected and didn't find out until after her child was born uh, very severely affected. So let's digress. Uh, myotonic dystrophy type two, this is, um, this is in the effort of, of getting towards some science. So myotonic dystrophy type two is a very, very similar disorder um, to myotonic dystrophy type one um, with weakness and systemic manifestations, just like myotonic dystrophy type one, with the exception of um, a different pattern of weakness and that myotonic dystrophy type two is generally a milder disease. Uh, myotonic dystrophy type two is caused by a tetranucleotide repeat on a different chromosome, happens to be chromosome three. You may recall myotonic dystrophy, uh, the gene is on chromosome 19. The repeat length in type two is much longer. Um, the repeat length does not always correlate with phenotype. Anticipation is not as clearly demonstrated. And in fact, the repeat length may not even be stable over the lifetime. So if you take a sample when an individual is 23 years old, it may not be the same as when you take a sample when that individual is 42 years old. So um, how is it possible that a mutation in a non-coding region of a gene, meaning again, that it doesn't code for a protein, it's in a in an untranslated part of the gene, so, so it shouldn't be as important, lead to so much widespread havoc, like all over the body. We have eyes, we have heart, we have muscles, we have endocrine stuff. So is the pathology in myotonic dystrophy related to the DMPK protein um, where, the, where the gene is located? Or is this, in fact, my favorite little picture, a red herring? So let's have some lessons in biochemistry, if you'll bear with me. So the pathogenesis of myotonic dystrophy and myotonic dystrophy 2. 
So the expanded trinucleotide or tetranucleotide allele is transcribed into RNA. So DNA turns into RNA. DNA is a double helix. RNA is a single helix. And the, um, the RNA contains long sequences of these um, repeats. So these are the CTG repeats of DNA turn into CUG repeats of RNA and the CCTG repeats of DNA turn into CCUG repeats of RNA. These RNA repeats cause the RNA to fold into a hairpin shape that you see here because these are complementary to each other. So they form little bonds like this and they, um, they just make this shape naturally. This globule of abnormal RNA which we would we can term mutant mutant RNAs, they accumulate in the nucleus of this of the cell as little nuclear foci, just little clumps that don't belong there. And these little clumps actually disrupt the regulation of the creation of something called mRNA. So within the cell, there's a lot of things that have to be controlled. And one of the things that has to be controlled is the construction of normal proteins. And the construction of normal proteins requires a lot of um, a lot of oversight by other little chaperone proteins. And that is called alternative splicing. And when this is disrupted by these nasty looking globules, everything gets fouled up. So let's look at an example of this. So on this side here, this is normal. This is what you want to see happen. So this is a normal gene on chromosome 19 without extra repeats. And under the normal circumstance, this DNA makes RNA. And these are the little chaperone proteins that I just mentioned. And under normal circumstances, and the gene, by the way, that's being chaperoned is this is the CLC1 gene. If you remember earlier, we discussed that that's the gene that creates the chloride channel that gets messed up. And when that gets messed up, you have myotonia. So we want a normal chloride channel so that we don't have myotonia. So here we have the DMPK RNA, and it is helping to make the CLC1 mRNA because it's helping along with the chaperone proteins. And under normal circumstances, when the DMPK RNA is there, everything normal happens with the chaperone proteins, and we get normal CLC1 mRNA, and then we get normal protein, and there won't be any myotonia, okay? Alternatively, when we have this big, huge expansion here in the disease state, then instead of this nice flat piece of RNA, we have this big, nasty hairpin. And what happens is half of these chaperone proteins, but only the blue ones, are getting stuck to this hairpin. And now this CLC RNA is getting all messed up. And so the CLC protein is not produced properly. So now we have no CLC protein, and now we're going to have myotonia. So because of the presence of this, glommy, nasty RNA hairpin, the chaperone proteins got messed up, we have no CLC channel protein produced, and now we're going to have myotonia. So this is just an example how this protein messed up the um, splicing of this other protein. Now the idea here is that this is what causes myotonia in myotonic dystrophy, but there are other proteins whose um, production gets similarly interfered with in the same way that lead to the cataracts or the connective tissue interference in the heart or whatever it is that causes the dysmotility in the gut or whatever it is that causes an increased risk of diabetes and so on and so on and so on. So this is how one, a mutation in this gene that doesn't even create a protein gets involved messing up the um, create the production of all these other proteins causing a multi-system disorder so it is in fact something we call an rna processing problem 
which is what I was just saying. So um, what happens is we don't get our CLC1 um, mRNA, so we don't get our CLC1 protein, and now we have um, a chloride channelopathy in the muscle as just one example of what's going on in myotonic dystrophy. So um, this leads us to how we're going to actually tackle this disease. So modern therapies are going to target the genetic defect, either the DNA or the RNA, where the mutation is. RNA-mediated therapies are much further along in development. There are a couple of reasons for that, which I'll explain. So RNA-mediated therapies are not actually gene therapy. Um, gene therapy um, gets at the DNA and changes your genome. There are some issues with gene therapy. I'm a believer in gene therapy, by the way. I think that um, there are some diseases for which gene therapy may someday be helpful, but gene therapy is a little bit of a riskier prospect because it permanently alters the genome. And um, once you put something in there, you can never get it out for gene therapy. So there are, um, there are some flies in the ointment there. Um, RNA-mediated therapies are a little bit um, cleaner. Um, but that being said, they, they have to be administered repeatedly, just like a regular medication has to be administered repeatedly because these RNAs, whoops, these RNAs are being um, created constantly. So um, again, this is not, RNA-mediated therapies are not gene therapies, they are targeted therapies and they are disease-modifying therapies, but technically speaking, they are not gene therapies. So um, how is this different than conventional therapy? So under normal circumstances, as we discussed, um, back to biochemistry 101, double-stranded DNA is made into single-stranded RNA, which then gets um, translated into protein. And under normal circumstances, this is where your traditional drugs work. They sort of act on these proteins here. And remember that we have a whole bunch of different proteins in myotonic dystrophy that are causing trouble. Some, some that we know of, but to be honest, some we don't. So we know about the one with the chloride channel, which is why I kept harping on it. But we don't know, for example, what the protein is that causes the GI dysmotility. So we don't actually have that target identified. Um, it's not clear to me that we know um, what causes infertility in myotonic dystrophy. So we don't really have that target identified either. But we do have this target identified, and this is sort of the key in lots of diseases. The further upstream you can go, the better off you are at sort of getting things under control. So this is the place to attack here. And what the, the, um, the concept is something called antisense inhibition. So this is where the problem is, right? You saw that the RNA, um, when it gets into that hairpin, that was the ugly thing. So we want to get rid of that. So what, what they do, we don't want to go down this pathway because we really don't know all of these targets. So what they do is, since this is single-stranded, it leaves us with an opportunity to make the complementary strand and sort of tie it up and take it out of um, take it out of the way so it can't sort of do its damage. And this here says no protein production, but that's not really what's happening. What's really happening here is that it's just being taken out of um, taken out of the space so that it can't interfere with um, with other um, alternative splicing activities. So once we get rid of this nasty RNA, then all of the bad things, all of the bad um, interfering with normal protein production doesn't happen. So that's the idea. So um, that being said, um, the devil is in the details as usual, because actually um, I should mention that surprisingly, um, creating this antisense strand here is surprisingly simple. Um, I probably doesn't sound so, but that is the kind of thing that can be done in very short order. So that's really not the problem. The problem is how do we deliver it? So how do you get this drug to where it needs to be? And the idea is that the RNA-mediated therapy gets attached to an antibody or a protein that is targeted to the relevant tissue. So this is a, a picture of an antibody, and then this is our single strand of, um, 
manufactured RNA. And believe it or not, we have two trials, um, one that's a little bit more ahead of another. So the first trial is called MARINA, and that's a phase one, two trial of a conjugated RNA mediated therapy. The second trial is called ACHIEVE. Um, MARINA, which is similar, MARINA has um, enrolled patients. ACHIEVE, I believe, is ready to enroll, but um, is only underway in New Zealand, I believe. Um, both of these are intravenous therapies, so they're given IV once monthly, I think. Um, because they are early phase trials, the outcome measures here are safety. So basically making sure that people don't get hurt by this, but they do check secondary outcome measures to start looking to see if there seems to be any effect on other uh, relevant measures. The numbers here are the um, call numbers on clinicaltrials.gov. So if anyone wants to look up either of these trials on clinicaltrials.gov, you can look it up by this number, but you can also um, at clinicaltrials.gov, you could put in Marina or Achieve and you'll get um, information about both of these trials. But it's super, super exciting that we are at the point now of actually giving to people um, true, truly potential disease modifying therapies that comes deeply from the science behind these diseases. And I just want to emphasize that it comes back to this, to just getting this um, nasty, nasty looking thing, just, you know, Xing it out of, of um, circulation so that we can get back to this nice, neat looking situation. So this was the past and the present, which is where we have myotonic dystrophy, affecting all of these organ systems <laughs> and we try to treat individual organ systems individual targets and this is the present and the future where we intervene before any of these organ systems can become affected thank you um, for your attention and um, I hope that potentially I'd be able to answer any questions that you might have. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, Dr. Ullman. We are so appreciative of, of your time and expertise here today. Um, it does look like we have a couple questions. Um, so let's, let me look in the chat here. All right. It's one of the questions was, could hypersomnolence be the cause of the apathy and cognitive decline? Maybe if the new drug helps with hypersomnolence, maybe it will also help with the other two issues? So I, first of all, I, I would say that's a very good question. I think that being tired um, definitely is an issue, can affect attention, um, which can certainly affect cognitive performance. But I think it's important to note that these are separate issues. So sometimes when you have multiple things happening in an individual, the only thing to do is to treat what's treatable and then sort of see what's left. So I would say that if an individual has hypersomnolence and that is a treatable issue, then it should be treated. But if, if there is still underlying cognitive decline and apathy, then that might be separate. So it's possible that some of those symptoms could resolve, but it's also possible that they might not. And then swallowing issues. Yeah. In my topic. Yeah. Yeah. So swallowing issues definitely can occur. Um, there is some debate about exactly why that is. So is it just pure weakness or is it an issue related to myotonia? It looks like it probably is related to weakness and dysmotility. So in my practice, if an individual is having trouble swallowing, I usually um, order a, a barium swallow to sort of see where the problem is. And then depending on the results, I'll send them for speech and language pathology evaluation so they can learn certain techniques that can be helpful with swallowing and also to be taught about food consistencies because certain food consistencies can be much easier to handle. 
And there are lots of things that can be learned about that. It is uncommon for people with myotonic dystrophy to need a feeding tube. That can happen um, in extreme circumstances and the guidance of a speech and language pathologist and your neurologist um, can, can definitely be helpful with that. It's uncommon, but not unheard of. Makes sense. Um, another question here, is there any way to combat the developmental um, or learning disabilities? In, in today's world, no. Um, we do not have um, a medical way to do that. However, um, early intervention programs can be extremely helpful with, with this kind of a situation and um, should be engaged as early on as possible. So I certainly have seen the benefits of that. And um, I am a firm believer, actually, there's, there's not necessarily data for this. So I hesitate to say anything there's not data for, but um, I'm a firm believer also in, um, in oh gosh, I can't think of, um, in companion animals, um, whatever kind of animal it is um, for um, social and emotional support. Um, I think I have seen great benefit there. So if that's a possibility, I would, I would do that. But also early intervention programs are really phenomenal and can be helpful until we have a solution for the organic issues. Definitely. And I, I will say that um, MDA has some great resources on special education and navigating IEPs and, and all that stuff to help support um, any developmental or learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. Um, let's see another question. Um, somebody shared that they went to a seminar in Rochester, New York several years ago, and there were trial drugs being tested. Do you know of the results? Well, up till now, nothing has proven effective. Um, there were a few things undergoing testing, um, and, and, um, nothing, nothing was successful. So I think, but to be fair, um, they were not these. Um, uh, mechanisms. So I think we're in a new time right now. The antisense oligonucleotides, which I was discussing, are sort of new to the playing field, and the issue of conjugating them to something that um, helps with targeting is very new. So while those previous um, those previous trials did not work out, I don't think it reflects on what's going on now. And uh, another question, is it common for a person with uh, DM1 to need a tracheostomy or a tracheotomy to, but, to breathe? Okay, so again, not common. I mean, I would say um, distinctly uncommon. Also not unheard of. Um, if, if there are respiratory problems, then again, um, that should be handled by a pulmonologist who is very skilled at non-invasive ventilation. I, I should also say that these days uh, there have been huge advances in non-invasive ventilation. I didn't show this during my talk, but now, aside from the full face mask, there are um, mouthpiece. There's mouthpiece ventilation that can be used during the day if you don't need the full face mask. So it's very, very uncommon to need tracheostomy if you're able to manage your secretions. Um, but it's not unheard of. I mean, it's, it's, I couldn't give you a percentage, but in my practice, um, over the last 20 years, I think I've only had, uh, taken care of one person who needed a tracheostomy, um, for myotonic dystrophy, maybe two total. Another question, um, is there a safe way to lose weight with myotonic dystrophy? Well, that's a tough one. Um, you know, the old advice, exercise and eat less, wears very thin, honestly. So I think that that is really a problem. It's very hard to exercise, and we, we do understand that. And it's also very hard to limit calories and calorie restrict. Um, I think the best thing to do under those circumstances, if you've been advised to lose weight, is to work with a dietitian. Dietitians can be really, really helpful in terms of giving you calorie goals that are realistic and fair and healthy, and also helping you work out a, a reasonable diet to achieve those calorie goals. Um, my, my advice is everything in moderation. So I'm not one of those people who would recommend, um, you know, 
giving up all the white stuff, by which I mean flour and sugar and everything like that, or or going on the Atkins diet, because I think in the long run, those things don't tend to work. So your best bet is really to work with a nutritionist or a dietitian and see what you can come up with together. But I think it's important to have realistic calorie goals. For sure. Um, and one more question here, are the Marina and Achieve trials for DM1, DM2, or both? Uh, right now they're for DM1. Um, that's my understanding. Um, and it's like we have time for maybe one more question here. I have a 20 year old daughter. Her mother's uh, 39 has DM1 with 1000 repeats. The daughter has not been tested as she has no symptoms and the, um, and due to life and health insurance issues, she hasn't been tested. Seeing the mother typically passes the gene and expansion. What are the chances that she has myotonic dystrophy? The daughter? Yes. Okay. So, um, you know, this is fairly complicated. I, I, I know I gave a lot of complicated information about population genetics and um, parental bias, but we still boil it down to 50%. And you can't get really too smart about this. So I would say that we can, we can, you know, do Bayesian genetics and things like that and, and be, um, try to be really specific. But basically, I would still say 50%. When you're thinking about genetic testing in a young adult, there are some major considerations. One of them uh, can be life insurance. It can affect your ability to get life insurance if you are if you have a genetic diagnosis. Not always, but sometimes. It will not affect your ability to get medical insurance. Um, that said, for someone who isn't ready yet to have children and who doesn't want to get tested yet, my advice is to assume that you have it and for that reason to avoid the anesthetics that need to be avoided and to see a cardiologist because at least in that way you can keep yourself safe but it is never it is never okay to assume you don't have it because the only way to really know that is to get genetic testing and otherwise you just can't be sure very good advice all right. Well, I know we're at the top of the hour and I want to be respectful of everyone's time, but thank you so much, Dr. Elman. This was very informative and, and thorough. So thank you for spending time with us this afternoon. My pleasure. And I want to thank our webinar supporter, Avidity Biosciences, for their support of this uh, educational program. And I'd like to just uh, encourage everybody to take a survey at the end of this webinar. It will pop up um, right after you X out. It will also be in an email follow up, but we love to hear your feedback and know what your thoughts were, what other topics we can cover. Um, you can also reach out to us at the email on the screen there. And we encourage you if you or your loved one are not a part of the MDA community yet to please join um, by going to our website. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Elman, and we appreciate everybody's time. And this concludes today's MDA Engage webinar on updates and in research and treatments for myotonic dystrophy.